There's something very peculiar about my city. It reacts to me. The more I explore it, the more flexible it becomes for me. It's fluid. No matter how I feel, there's always some place in the city I can go. I was very lucky to come here when the city lost its heart. We had five councillors who realised that Melbourne had become a nine to five city. They were really concerned it was going to decentralise and everything was going to go out to the suburbs. So they sort of came with this idea of urban design, um, of a way of uh, refurbishing the city and my job was really to get all the details right. And what we did was basically a block at a time. So we just fixed one thing at a time. We'd go and show the councillors what we'd done. And they'd go, that's cool. And you'd go, yeah, and that looks like rubbish. So we could sort of carry on. We don't have a view like Sydney. We don't have a Sydney Opera House. We don't have, you know, beautiful views out to the sea and an incredible bay or any of those sort of things. This is a man-made city. And so a lot of uh, what we've done is essentially taking advantage of the good structure and the skeleton of Melbourne and just showing people about what you can do with it. Melbourne was designed by a guy called Hoddle and what he did was he made all the streets 30 metres wide from building line to building line. He made all the lanes 10 metres wide and he made all of the little lanes 5 metres wide. All these lanes came into being because the building owners were trying to access the backs of buildings. The easiest lanes to renovate and look after are the ones that run straight through. This is the causeway. A lady called Fiona Harrison designed this, and it has these little quirky silver strips that run through it. Because she knows that the bluestone gets darker over time, the stainless steel will start to shine out even more. When we came up with this idea of creating consistent paving patterns and getting a consistent range of furniture. Had a lot of trouble selling it to all the building owners. They basically said, city's fine, why well, don't use it, who cares, you know. It's really funny, people with public space don't value it. They don't devalue it either. They just see it as like a non-entity thing. And so when a city starts to say, you know, the streets, to us are the critically the most important things of the city, and so are the park. People say, well, gee, so you think it's a great place? And we go, we reckon it's a great place. For a long time, we've talked about building owners punching holes in walls. They might have a shop like that. If you punched a hole in that wall, you could do coffee off the side of it, you could sell jewelry. And so a place that's unloved, uncared for, all of a sudden becomes interesting and quirky. And there's quite a few places in the city where you know, they're just a little hole in the wall and people stand outside the front waiting for coffee. And there's coffee everywhere, but that's the place they go. There is a formula, a, what I call a squashy formula. But what you want to do, it's like, it's like a cool cafe that you go to and it's got a really good vibe. Everybody's squashed into it and all of a sudden they take over the tenancy next door and it loses that vibe. So it's about keeping that energy up.
taken the retailers a long time in the city to learn this lesson of uh, decorate a window, you make the place look inviting and a lot safer, and you get to sell stock as well, you know, when you're not even in the shop. One of the things that I've got proposed for the end of the street is a five metre pair of scissors that sit at the end of the lane. And uh, this building on, owner on the right hand side doesn't love us at the moment, but we're working on it. In 1992, 40% of the buildings were empty above the first floor. This guy called John Nags said, I'm sure if we reticulated one of these buildings, we could actually get residents to move in. In 1992, we actually had five residents living in the city. Today, we have 29,000 living in the city. This street was full of probably the unhappiest people I've ever met in my life. The minute the residents moved in and they started looking around for milk and bread and all that sort of stuff, there was absolutely nothing you could buy in the city anyway. All this changed overnight. design something that's fashionable, it'll date really quickly. So the best way of keeping the quality up is to do good quality, seamless design, timeless design to start with. In the end of the day, we have no power of anyone, so it's about trying to influence building owners, trying to get people to take advantage of what they have. The spillover then results in a great public space that everybody goes, this is a quirky, cool place, I've got to come here. Without that, you end up with a dim place, you end up with unsavoury behaviour, you end up with all those things that a dead city suffers from. How do you keep people safe? More people. The more people you're going to attract, the safer, the more interesting, the more exciting it will be. We're standing at Federation Square. This wasn't always here. This corner is being characterized by, we wouldn't call them great buildings. Um, you'd call them sort of character buildings. On this site was one of those non-60 design things. It didn't complement the corner at all. People criticized it a lot and said what an empty, useless space it was and how it didn't contribute anything. The team really thought, how could this be a better place? And slowly by slowly, we managed to talk the state government into it. One of our criteria that we had in this was to ensure that there's a laneway system that runs through. They didn't want any poles in the space. In fact, they thought they could light it with the moonlight, and we said, oh, we can't actually do that. It actually has to be safe public lighting. So we came up with the idea of lights on a wire. I observe, I discover, I engage, I create, I relax. I don't have to change who I am to be here. I mold the city to fit who I am.
cities that succeed are the cities that you feel that you discover. But if you can find a city that you can get into and get lost in, then you almost really go away from that city with memories that are rich. That's the cerebral experience of a city. Understanding what makes it tick, what makes the locals tick, and, and how the locals actually enjoy it.